Welcome to the first unit of asepsis, isolation, and sterile technique. So a major concern for healthcare professionals is that danger of spreading microorganisms from person to person and also from place to place. So prevention of infection is an, a major focus of the nursing care team. As primary caregivers, nurses are involved in identifying, preventing, controlling, treating, and teaching patients about infection. Before we delve into the lecture, I want to start the class out with discussing two important core concepts that I hope will become a part of your clinical practice while you're in school and also carry on into your professional career. These concepts are patient safety and quality care. So every nurse wants and intends to deliver safe, accurate, and appropriate care to our patients. However, it's important to understand that every patient care event does have the potential to go wrong. Errors happen as a result of poor system design, poor communication, uh, wrong assumptions, maybe poor teamwork, and simply a lack of knowledge. So QSIN stands for Quality and Safety Education for Nurses, and they have identified six elements where nursing can make a difference in ensuring safety and quality for patients and also improve patient outcomes. So the first one is patient-centered care. So this goes beyond demonstrating compassion, caring, and respect for the patient. It involves a recognition of patient control and forming a partnership involving the patient in all phases of their care. The second is teamwork and collaboration. A nurse must be able to function effectively within the nursing and interprofessional teams. We need to demonstrate open communication, mutual respect, and shared decision-making. The third is evidence-based practice. This means that we are integrating the best current evidence with our clinical expertise. So we should be asking ourselves, why do we do what we do? And does the science and research currently support this particular action? The fourth is quality improvement. And here we are using data that we are gathering to monitor the outcomes of the care that we are providing. Safety is minimizing the risk of harm to patients and to providers such as ourselves as well. And then informatics is using information and the technology that's available to communicate, to manage all that data that we're collecting, um, to mitigate or prevent error, and also to support the decisions that we're making. So you're gonna be hearing a lot more about QSIN as you go through the program. In this class, as we go through the different skills and assessments, please be thinking about how these principles can be incorporated. Um, if you want more information, there's a link to the QSIN website, um, as well as a link to the Joint Commission National Patient Safety Goals in the class website. So on to the topic of the week, which is asepsis. So the practice of asepsis includes all the activities that we can use to prevent infection or break that chain of infection. So there are two categories of asepsis. There's medical asepsis and surgical asepsis. So medical asepsis is the use of clean technique. So this involves all the procedures and practices that reduce the number and transfer of pathogens. Uh, examples include um, performing hand hygiene and wearing gloves. Surgical asepsis is known as sterile technique. The techniques used in maintaining surgical asepsis are much more rigid than those under medical asepsis. This includes practices to make and keep objects and areas free from microorganisms. It involves the practice of setting up a sterile field, applying and wearing sterile gloves, handling sterile instruments without contaminating them. So although many initially think that sterile technique is limited to the operating room, it is used in many places and procedures done throughout all the facilities. Um, you will use sterile technique at the patient bedside when doing certain procedures, such as inserting a Foley catheter, starting an IV, or maybe even changing a wound dressing. So for an infection to occur, a chain of events must take place, and those are outlined on the slide. So what we're looking to do is break that chain at any point through the use of infection control measures, therefore decreasing the likelihood that an infection can take place. So we're gonna take a brief look at each element, starting with the infectious agent or pathogen. These include bacteria, viruses, and fungi. 
So remember that the human body normally contains microorganisms and this normal flora does not cause disease when residing in their usual area of the body. However, any factor that upsets the balance of the normal flora or causes it to migrate to another body area puts the person at risk for infection. Bacteria are the most significant and most commonly observed infection causing agents in the healthcare setting. Remember that most bacteria are aerobic, meaning that it requires oxygen to live and multiply. Those bacteria that can live without oxygen are referred to as anaerobic. Another way that bacteria can be classified is by their reaction to the gram stain. Gram positive bacteria tend to have a cell wall that's very thick and they will stain purple. Gram negative bacteria have a more complex cell wall and they don't stain. So you're going to be learning in pharmacology that this information is important and may need to be considered when we're choosing the appropriate and most effective antibiotic. So asepsis actions that can be taken to break the chain at this point are listed on your slide. So the reservoir is the habitat of the organism, basically where they can grow and reproduce. So pathogenic and non-pathogenic organisms constantly exist in our internal and external environment. Humans are the most common reservoir of pathogens that can infect themselves. So keep in mind that a dry, cool, well-ventilated area is less conductive to microbial growth than a moist, warm, unventilated area. Contamination in clean techniques occurs if dirty objects come in contact with clean objects. So some examples of asepsis actions that can be done at this point are also included on your slide. So the portal of exit, um, think of this as the primary route of escape for the organism. So asepsis or actions um, focus on setting up a barrier or prevention of the exit of the microorganisms from their site. So transmission, this is the method by which organisms are spread. Once a pathogen has exited the reservoir, it needs a mode of transmission to get into the new host. So direct contact is the person-to-person -person transmission of pathogens, which includes touching, biting, kissing, or sexual intercourse. Inanimate objects such as eating utensils, soil Kleenex, doorknobs and handles, computer keyboards, surgical instruments, um, the phones that nurses carry or wound dressings are common objects that can also transmit infection. Spread of airborne droplets is also a form of direct contact, but only if the host is in within three feet of the reservoir. So sneezing, coughing, spitting, talking, or even singing can transmit droplets into the eyes, nose, or mouth of the new host. If airborne droplets are further away than three feet, it's considered an indirect transmission. So vectors then are non-human carriers that transmit organisms from one host to another. Think about ticks, mosquitoes, and uh, lice. Um, those would be good examples of vectors. So the portal of entry uh, this is frequently the same as the portal of exit. For example, airborne pathogens from one person's sneeze will enter the nose and thus the respiratory tract of the new host. So restaurant workers who don't wash their hands after using the restroom can contaminate food that's then um, consumed through the GI tract. The final element in the chain of infection is a susceptible host or someone that is at risk for infection. Infection does not occur automatically when the pathogen enters the body of a person whose immune system is functioning normally. So however, the risk is much greater when the pathogen enters a host who has a risk factor that's listed on your slide. So whether exposure to the pathogen results in an infection depends on several factors related to the person exposed, the type of pathogen, and the environment. Again, fortunately, there are many methods that nurses can use to reduce that risk. There are some stages of infection. It goes through um, incubation, prodromal, full-stage illness, and then convalescent. So incubation is the time 
between the pathogen's entry into the body and the appearance of the symptoms of infection. During this stage, the pathogen is multiplied and the length of incubation varies depending on the organism. For example, the common cold has an incubation period of one to two days. Prodromal stage. A person is typically most infectious during the prodromal stage. Early signs and symptoms of the illness are present, but they're often vague and nonspecific, such as the patient feeling tired or maybe having a low-grade fever. The problem is, is that during this phase, the patient does not often realize that he or she is contagious and often continues about their daily routine, and thus the infection can be transmitted to others. Then there's the full stage illness. The presence of specific signs and symptoms indicates that the patient is in this stage. Um, symptoms uh, that are limited to occur in only one body area are called localized symptoms, while symptoms that are manifested throughout the entire body, such as fever, are referred to as systemic symptoms. And then this is the stage where the patient actually feels really sick. Um, and then you've got the convalescent period and that's also known as the recovery. Uh, the length of this stage often depends on the severity of the infection and the patient's overall general condition. So the localized infection can result in your redness, swelling, warmth in the affected area, pain or tenderness, or even loss of function of the affected part. A systemic infection often includes fever, increased pulse, increased respirations, uh, anorexia, or the patient not being hungry, and maybe enlargement of lymph nodes. So the symptoms of the inflammatory response are caused by the vascular and cellular changes going on. An increase in the blood flow causes the redness and the heat in the area. White cells then move in quickly to engulf the invading organism and try to consume the cell debris and foreign material. Exudate is that fluid cells and inflammatory byproducts being released. Another defense mechanism that the human body has is the immune response, which involves the antigens, which are developed by the body to mount a response to what the body sees as a foreign invader. And you're going to learn more about all these specific body uh, responses in later classes. So we can't go on before we talk about no nosocomial infection. So in the United States, hospital patients get an estimated 700,000 infections every year. Uh, that's about one infection for every 25 patients. So MRSA is currently responsible for about 40% of the nosocomial infections. Um, it usually occurs in patients who have invasive procedures such as surgery, uh, have an IV or respiratory therapy treatment. It's easy to transmit because it frequently colonizes or lives on skin. Proper hand washing or hand hygiene is the single most effective and important intervention to prevent these infections. Convincing evidence that hand hygiene practices lead to a reduction of infection caused by multi-drug resistant bacteria has been presented in reports by the World Health Organization. For example, when hand hygiene compliance in healthcare facilities increases from 60% to 90%, there can be a 24% reduction in MRSA um, acquisition. So hand hygiene is extremely important in um, fighting infection. So again, uh, most healthcare associated infections are preventable through good hand hygiene, which is cleaning the hands at the right time and in the right way. Uh, the class is going to review the two most common used in healthcare settings, the hand wash and the hand rub. So there are a wide selection of hand hygiene agents available to promote safe patient care. If the healthcare worker's hands are not visibly soiled, the alcohol-based hand rubs are recommended because they save time, are easy to use, and have been demonstrated to reduce bacterial count. Um, obviously, uh, soap and water or hand wash is used if the hands are visibly soiled um, or if caring for certain patients um, that carry C. diff, MRSA, or VRE um, anytime after using the restroom or um, before eating. So keep in mind that hand hygiene also goes beyond cleaning the hands. It also includes attention to the fingernails, which can harbor pathogens. For nursing, nails should be unpolished and less than a quarter inch long. 
chipped nail polish, long nails, artificial nails, gel nails, nail extenders, etc. can tear gloves and they can harbor pathogens even after careful hand washing or the use of surgical scrubs. That is why many units um, and hospital facilities um, do not allow any of those nail products. So there are some challenges to hand um, hygiene practice. Understaffing or high workloads can lead the staff to feeling as if there's not enough time to wash their hands. Sinks or sanitizer dispensers may not be located in easily reached or accessible areas. Staff may not think that a routine activity such as shaking a patient's hand or going in to get a blood pressure requires hand hygiene. Um, frequent hand hygiene can, for some people, cause skin irritation or dryness, leading to um, staff to avoid the use of hand gels or soap and water. And then there's also the perception that just simply putting on a pair of gloves reduces any need to perform hand hygiene. So there's also respiratory and stethoscope hygiene. So respiratory hygiene involves simple steps to prevent the spread of respiratory illness, such as colds and influenza. Covering your mouth and nose with the tissue when you cough or sneeze is an example. So obviously if we don't have a cough uh, or have a tissue, um, coughing or sneezing into the crook of the elbow, um, not into your hands, um, should be taught and many um, kids are learning that in school these days and then follow up with hand washing. Um, in regard to stethoscope hygiene, there was a study in 2013 that looked at the prevalence of stethoscope cleaning um, at a um, UK medical school and they found that only 3.9% of respondents cleaned their stethoscope after every patient and only 9.7% cleaned it at least once daily. So other studies have shown that um, following an exam, aerobic colony count on the diaphragm of the stethoscope was substantially higher than for um, every location on the provider's hands except for their fingertips. So those findings suggested that every time you use your stethoscope, it picks up microorganisms from the patient's body surface. The bell and diaphragm then serve as a culture medium to sustain and foster that microbial growth and then they transmit those organisms to every subsequent patient that the device touches. So it's even possible for the providers to contaminate themselves because we throw that stethoscope around our neck, um, etc. So um, the Division of Infectious Disease at um, Emory University in Atlanta um, encouraged the use of an alcohol-based hand sanitizer to clean hands as well as stethoscopes between patients. And they're hoping that this would become a accepted bedside practice. Um, studies did show then that that decreased that risk of transmission. Um, they emphasized that although cleaning the stethoscope with an alcohol wipe was more effective than the alcohol-based hand rub, um, it's a little bit more uh, time consuming and less convenient for clinicians to be carrying an alcohol wipe um, and therefore they would be less likely to do it. So um, the ha alcohol based hand rub um, on the stethoscope surface um, and along the tubing did help decrease the colony count enough that um, they felt that was effective. Um, you can use an alcohol prep pad to clean off your diaphragm and your bell. Um, just keep in mind that the use of the hand sanitizer and the alcohol on your uh, stethoscope could leave a filmy buildup on the stethoscope and uh, might break down the seal on the diaphragm. So you will need to probably replace your stethoscope you know, every 10 years or so. Uh, per personal protective equipment or PPE are those devices and equipment that um, provide, provide that barrier between potential contaminants and potential points of entry. So the choice of the barrier depends on the task being formed um, and also the patient's diagnosis. So gloves are the most common type of PPE used in the healthcare setting. Uh, gloves should fit the user's hands comfortably. They should not be too loose or too tight. They should also not tear or damage easily. 
When wearing gloves, limit the opportunity for touch contamination. Protect yourself, others, and environmental surfaces. How many times have you seen somebody adjust their glasses, rub their nose, or touch their face with gloves on that have been in contact with a patient? Um, this is one example of touch contamination that can potentially expose yourself to infectious agents. So think about environmental surfaces too and avoid unnecessary touching them with contaminated gloves. Surfaces such as light switches, door and cabinet knobs can become contaminated if touched by soiled gloves. So gloves are usually worn to prevent the soiling of the healthcare workers clothing, I, I should say gowns, um, by the patient's blood or body fluids. Uh, they provide barrier protection and are put on before entering the patient's room. Gowns should fully cover the torso, fit comfortably over the body, and have long sleeves that fit snugly at the wrist. Masks uh, prevent the wearer from inhaling large particle viruses or droplets, which usually travel a short distance, that three foot distance, and airborne particles, which can remain suspended in the air and travel longer distances. A mask is only worn once and is never lowered around the neck and brought back up over the nose and mouth. There's some debate on how long a single mask can be worn, but it has been determined that a mask must be changed before it becomes damp from the wearer's breath. Surgical masks filter only expired air, while the HEPA-style respirator masks filter inspired air. Protective eyewear such as goggles or a face shield need to be available and worn whenever there's a risk of contaminating the eyes. Goggles should fit snugly over and around the eyes, or if um, the person wears glasses, they should fit comfortably over the glasses. Goggles with anti-fog features will help maintain the clarity of vision. The face shield should cover the forehead, extend down below the chin, and also wrap around the side of the face. So using isolation precautions is the subject of the next couple of slides. So knowing which um, PPE to use um, comes down to what might be ordered and also the nurse's judgment. So as a nurse, you'll need to assess each patient's situation to understand what PPE is necessary to care for that patient. If any patient is on tier two precautions, which we'll talk about in a minute, make sure you have all the supplies plus a few extra in case of accidental contamination um, that you need before you apply PPE and enter the room. So the Center for Disease um, Control and Prevention issues recommendations for when and what PPE should be used to prevent exposure to infectious disease. So there are four key points to remember about PPE. First, don it before you have any contact with the patient, generally before entering the room. Two, once you have PPE on, use it carefully to prevent spreading contamination. Three, once you've completed your task, remove the PPE carefully and discard it in the receptacles provided. And four, immediately perform hand hygiene before going on to the next patient. So when putting on PPE, we do hand hygiene and then we don the gown. The mask or respirator should be put on next and properly adjusted to fit. Remember to fit check your respirator. The goggles or face sheet face shield, then is donned, and then the, the gloves go on last. To remove PPE safely, you must first be able to identify what sites are considered clean and what are contaminated after your patient contact. In general, the outside front and the sleeves of the isolation gown and the outside front of the goggles, mask, respirator, and face shield are considered contaminated regardless of whether there's visible soil. And of course, the outside of the gloves are contaminated. The sequence for removing PPE is intended to limit the opportunities for self-contamination. There are a variety of ways to safely remove PPE without contaminating your clothing, skin, or mucous membrane. You should remove all PPE before exiting the patient room except the respirator if worn. Remove the respirator after leaving the patient room and closing the door. So the CDC approves of two approaches to removing PPE. In version number one, the gloves are considered the most contaminated pieces of PPE and therefore are removed first. 
then the face shield or goggles are next because they are more cumbersome and would interfere with the removal of the other PPE. The gown is third in sequence, followed by the mask or respirator, and then hand hygiene. In version two, the gown and gloves can be removed together in the first step. This is done by grasping the gown on the front and you pulling it away from your body so that the ties break and you're only touching the outside of the glove only with your gloved hands. While removing the glove, then you gown, you then fold or roll the gown inside out into a bundle. And as you're removing the gown, you're peeling off your gloves at the same time, only touching the inside of the gloves and gown with your bare hands. Place the gown and gloves in a waste container. Then again, move the eyewear, followed by the mask or respirator, and then the hand hygiene. So of course, where to remove um, PPE, the location for removing PPE will depend on the amount and type of PPE worn and the category of isolation the patient is on. If only gloves are worn, it's safe to remove and discard them in the patient room. When a full gown or full PPE is worn, um, PPE is removed at the doorway um, or in the little ante room if there's a little cubicle um, before you go into the room. Respirators are always removed outside the patient room after the door is closed. Hand hygiene should be performed after all PPE is removed. So isolation refers to the precautions that are taken in the hospital to prevent the spread of an infectious agent from an infected or colonized patient to other susceptible patients. So isolation practices are designed to minimize the transmission of infection in the hospital using current understanding of the way infections can be transmitted. Isolation should be done in a user-friendly, well-accepted, inexpensive way that interferes as little as possible with patient care, minimizes patient discomfort, and avoids unnecessary use. So the CDC um, has led the way in defining guidelines for hospital-based infection precautions. The most current system recommended for use in hospitals consists of the two levels. The first level or tier one is standard precautions which apply to all patients at all times because signs and symptoms of an infection are not always obvious and therefore may po pose an unknowing risk um, to other susceptible people. The second level or tier two is known as transmission-based precautions, which are intended for individuals who have a known or suspected infection with certain organisms. So standard precautions, again, apply um, to all patients, and um, they include hand hygiene, wearing clean non-sterile gloves, using PPE as appropriate, following cough adequate, uh, safe injection practices, not recapping needles, and reviewing patient room assignments carefully. So in some instances, um, healthcare personnel are required to wear PPE in addition to what's recommended for standard precautions. The three expanded precaution categories um, are contact, droplet, and airborne. So contact precautions are put into place in addition to standard precautions when in contact with individuals known or suspected of having diseases that are spread by direct or indirect contact, such as norovirus, rotavirus, or head lice. Um, contact precautions um, mean that we wear gloves and a gown when in contact with the individual surfaces or objects within the environment. All reusable items that are taken into an exam room or the home, if you're doing home care, should be cleaned and disinfected before removed. Disposable items should be discarded at the point of use. So droplet precautions are those precautions that in addition to the standard precautions, staff wear a surgical mask with, when they're within three feet um, of persons known or suspected of having diseases spread by droplets, such as influenza, pertussis, meningococcal, smallpox, etc. Airborne precautions uh, use the following procedures in addition to standard precautions when individuals are known or suspected to have diseases spread by fine particles dispersed by air currents such as TB, measles, and SARS. So in this case, um, 
we put on a certified fit tested N95 respirator just before entry to an area of shared airspace and wear it at all times within that area. Um, remove and discard the respirator just after exiting the patient care area. Um, and a powered air purifying respirator, a PAPR, may also be used. Um, if available, um, portable high efficiency particulate air or HEPA filtration units may be operated in the area where the infected individual is located to filter out infectious particles. However, the use of this unit in that room does not eliminate the need for employees to wear respiratory protection. So the CDC also talks about protective environments and these are for patients who have a com compromised immune system and they require a different approach to isolation. Um, examples of these types of patients are those receiving chemotherapy or have undergone organ transplant. So as with all patients, standard precautions are required, but some additional measures are used when the ability of the patient to um, withstand a bacterial invasion has been compromised. So as many patients are managing chemotherapy on an outpatient basis, some of these extra steps are then implemented in the home environment as well. So the, the use of extended precautions is necessary in certain circumstances. Um, although essential, isolation has also been associated with adverse effects in patients. Um, studies do show a negative impact on the patient mental well-being and their behavior, including, including higher scores for depression, anxiety, or anger among those that are isolated. Patients may feel rejected or unclean when approached by staff wearing PPE. So it's really important that you explain the purpose and the use to both the patient and the family. Communication through masks, face shields, etc., cetera, can, commu can cause communication barriers. The spoken word may be less clear and understandable, and patients may not be able to see the nonverbal facial expressions that are an important part of communication. Studies also show that healthcare workers spend less time with patients in isolation. This is due to the amount of time it takes to put on and remove PPE. So as care providers, we're more likely to minimize the number of, of trips into the room and we kind of consolidate our care. So patient satisfaction was also adversely affected by isolation if patients were kept uninformed of their health care. So patient safety is also effective, leading to an eightfold increase in adverse events related to supportive care failures because we're not in the room as often. This slide goes over um, creating a sterile field using a sterile drape. Um, it's one of the cornerstones of, of infection prevention. A sterile field is that work surface that's prepared to hold sterile equipment during a sterile technique procedure. The sterile field provides an area in which sterility is continually maintained. The purpose of the sterile drape is to eliminate the passage of microorganisms between the non-sterile and sterile areas. Draping materials may be disposable or non-disposable. Disposable drapes are generally a paper and plastic combination and non-disposable drapes are usually muslin that then can be uh, sterilized through um, the hospital procedures. And this slide just talks about um, the different techniques that are used to add sterile items to a sterile field. So there are some principles of sterile technique to be familiar with. Um, we'll talk about these in more depth in class. Um, there's also some discussion about a new recommendation about keeping conversations to a minimum in the presence of a sterile field. Remember that we talked about how talking can um, provide a portal of exit for bacteria, even though you have a mask on. Um, so um, they are looking at decreasing the amount of conversation that occurs in certain areas. Um, again, at first glance, aseptic methods may appear complex and overly time consuming, but with proper training, pr planning and practice, sterile technique becomes readily incorporated into your nursing practice and becomes second nature. 
And this is just some more examples of um, some principles of sterile technique. So we'll go over the sterile gloving technique on how to apply sterile gloves so that you maintain um, sterile technique um, and do not contaminate your gloves. And I will be demonstrating that in class, but this outlines the steps of that procedure. And then removing gloves also has a specific procedure so that you do not self-contaminate. Um, and this too will be demonstrated in class and then you'll be practicing both putting sterile gloves on and taking them off with a peer. And that ends the first lecture.